Thank you very much for having me here at this workshop and welcome everyone to my presentation on implicit neural representations, in particular how we can move from object representations to 3D scene representations. And this is joint work with a number of collaborators, both at ETH Zurich and at uh, Intel and University and Max Planck Tübingen. Traditionally, 3D, 3D reconstruction using deep learning has been approached using discrete output representations such as voxels, point clouds, or meshes. However, each of these representations comes with certain disadvantages that stem from their discrete nature. Voxel-based representations do not scale to very large resolutions. Point-based representations lose topology and mesh-based representations are difficult to infer via neural networks and therefore require either a template mesh that needs to be deformed or lead to non-watertight reconstructions. In our work at CVPR 2019, we've proposed an alternative representation called occupancy networks, where instead of representing the output explicitly, we represent the output, the surface, implicitly as the decision boundary of a neural network classifier that distinguishes insides from outside points. However, this representation, despite being able to produce smooth outputs and handle complex topology has certain limitations that stem from the structure of the implicit neural representations. The way that this representation works is that there is an input um, X that is encoded using um, a uh, feature representation. And then there's a 3D location, a 3D point that's also fed into this network, and this network is typically a simple fully connected network, such as a residual network, or multiple blocks of a residual network, that then outputs for this particular 3D location, and given this input image X, a probability of occupancy for that particular 3D location. Now, the problem with this is that we have a global latent code here that doesn't capture local information in the input and therefore leads to overly smooth geometry, as we can also see here. Furthermore, the uh, function class of possible shapes is limited fundamentally through the architecture of the neural network. Here we use a simple fully connected, a vanilla fully connected neural network that doesn't, for instance, exploit translation equivariance properties that are present in many input domains. And this results in the fact that implicit models work well for simple objects, but poorly on complex scenes. If we apply the occupancy network from before that worked very well on an individual bench, now to this scene here, in this case, the input is a sparse, noisy point cloud of the scene. This is the ground truth that we see here. Then the output looks something like this. So the network is really not able to capture the details of the scene precisely. The question we were asking now is, well, how can we actually reconstruct larger scenes using these implicit neural representations that seem so promising, but are fundamentally limited to these object-based representations? And that led us to the idea of convolutional occupancy networks. In convolutional occupancy networks, the idea is to combine the advantages of convolutions with implicit representations. Here's a very simple form of our convolutional occupancy networks. I will show you multiple variants. Given a sparse and noisy point cloud of the input shape, we use a point net encoder um, per column on a 2D feature plane. So we discretize now the um, domain let's say the, the ground in terms of a 2D feature plane and encode the features for a particular pixel on that plane by all the points, by a representation that's derived from all the points that are within that red cuboid here using a point net encoding. Now we have local information on that 2D feature plane. And then we use a 
2D UNet to aggregate information on that 2D feature plane, which integrates this equivariant um, inductive bias into the model. After the 2D UNet, we can then query the features at every 3D point using bilinear interpolation in this 2D canonical feature plane. So if we want to query the features of this point, we project it um, to the feature plane, and then we do a bilinear interpolation of the features that are the output of the 2D unit. So these adjacent um, pixels here. Now we have more rich local features, which means that we need a more shallow network, a more shallow occupancy network only, that has the same function as before. It takes as input a 3D location and the features, and produces an occupancy probability. We can also do this for multiple canonical planes. We can use um, three canonical planes, for instance, have three different units that operate on these three planes, and we then simply concatenate the features from all these three planes. We can also use a volumetric representation. Instead of projecting onto feature planes, we can just project into volumetric space so we have a local point net that aggregates information now within this red box here. And then we have a 3D unit that operates on this coarse 3D representation, gives us features in that coarse 3D representation. And then we have a readout unit in the form of an occupancy network that now queries the adjacent voxels using trilinear interpolation in order to obtain features for a particular location. And then combines this with the 3D location in order to derive using this fully connected network and occupancy probability. So here's a direct comparison of the two methods. On the top, we can see the traditional occupancy network. On the bottom, we can see the convolutional variant, where now the features are not a global code anymore, but they are distributed in 3D space, and they can benefit from the equivariant properties of convolutional networks, either in 2D or 3D space. So how does this work? Let's look at some results. So here we first looked at, uh, we, first, we first wondered if we can also improve the quality of object level reconstructions. And it turns out that this is the case in particular for complex object shapes. So here we can see the input on the left. We can either work with a coarse voxelization of the object that we wanna refine, or we can take a point cloud as input. Just means we need to use different encodings here. Then we see the original occupancy network results here in the second column, which loses quite some details. And then we have the results of our convolutional occupancy network here in the third column, which retains much more details of this lamp here, for instance, or of this desk here. On the right, we see the ground truth. We also observed that using convolutional occupancy networks yields to faster training compared to standard occupancy networks, as we can see here from this plot. Here on the top, we can see the um, 3D variant and the free plane 2D variant of our convolutional occupancy networks versus the traditional occupancy network here in blue. So not only do we achieve higher validation IOU, but we also um, converge faster to this higher IOU. Now let's look at how well this model now works for what we wanted to do, scene level reconstruction. The input here is a point cloud of a synthetic room scene. So we build a little generative model to produce synthetic rooms based on combining objects from the shape in the database. And we can see on the right, the ground truth and the reconstructions of occupancy network, Poisson surface reconstruction as a baseline and our model. As you can see, occupancy network produces smooth results but fails in recovering the details. Poisson surface reconstruction leads to very noisy results and our method leads to nice and smooth reconstructions. Now this was trained and evaluated on synthetic rooms from the same distribution, but we can also take this model trained on synthetic rooms and evaluate it on the scanner data set. And this is what we did here. And it actually turns out that it generalizes quite well from synthetic to real data, at least using point clouds as input. 
So here we have a input point cloud from the scanner data set. And then we see the result of occupancy network, personal surface reconstruction, and our reconstructions. We also tested it on much larger scenes. Because we have a convolutional model, a fully convolutional model, we can scale this to scenes as large as the Matterport dataset. We train it on synthetic crops, and then we evaluate on this large scene using sliding windows. Now, this model using the sliding window approach scales to any scene because we can load sliding windows into memory as we desire, and then erase them from memory once we have them processed and stitch the results together. As long as the receptive field doesn't grow too big, but we typically operate with receptive field sizes of uh, room size, which still um, works well with the discretization that we choose for the 3D representation. So the key insights here are, well, convolutional models allow for scaling implicit models to larger scenes, which is great. So we can even tackle scenes as large as the Matterport dataset. Convolutional models also train faster compared to fully implicit models. And they allow for incorporating local feature information. For objects, we found that the 3D, uh, free plane model has the best accuracy memory trade-off. But for larger scenes, we found the volumetric representation to work best. And we also found that the models, at least using point clouds as input, transfer actually quite well from synthetic to real scenes. Now, all of the results that presented so far were um, targeted towards highly accurate geometry. But what about appearance? And in particular, what about realistic appearance? Appearance that changes with respect to the viewpoint of the observer. I want to briefly present now some very recent work that we did on um, representing surface light fields using implicit representations. The problem is defined as follows. Given the 3D geometry that's ever derived using an implicit method or another method, and a real image of that object as an input to a neural network, we want to infer for a particular viewpoint or light location what the object would look like. So here this is a real result of our method where we take this image as input and this geometry as input. And then we can manipulate the light source such that you can see the object is differently lit, the shadows look differently or we can manipulate the viewpoint which, uh, with a fixed light source, which also changes the shadows and the shading of the object. Existing representations can't do this. So for instance, the texture field approach that we presented um, last year is not able to um, recover view-dependent appearance information. While this is uh, leading to 3D consistent results, it basically just represents texture. It's a mapping from a 3D point to a color value. So it's not viewpoint independent and it cannot model lighting. The idea behind our conditional surface light fields now is to also condition this neural network on the viewpoint and the light location. Here on the top, we see the traditional rendering equation that's used in computer graphics, where the illumination is computed as the integral over some um, BRDF representation, some reflection model, times the light source, and it's also a quantity of the normal and uh, the incoming rays that are integrated over here. Now, what we want to do with a conditional surface light field approach is we want to get rid of the normals, so we don't uh, we model the surface light field only conditioned on a particular object, which means that we model this inner term here um, using a neural network that depends on the 3D point location P, the viewpoint direction V, and the lighting direction L. And then at test time, we can use the rendering equation and use our model inside that rendering equation to generate images for arbitrary light sources or environment maps by integrating over the environment map, for instance. Here on the bottom, you can see a graphical representation of what our network does. It takes the 3D point, the view direction, and the light setting as input, 
and produces a color vector as output. So let's look at some examples. So the first result that we um, performed, the first experiment that we performed was overfitting to a single object. So the input here is the shape of a single object. And we minimize the reconstruction loss between a target image. We use a uh, photorealistic database with materials here. There's actually not that many databases, unfortunately, that can be used, but there is one for chairs. Um, and try to minimize the reconstruction error here. And the model takes like now this input shape and queries the input shape using its depth map at every 3D location. And we have split the model into two parts. There's an appearance field that first calculates an appearance vector from this information. And then there's a lighting model that takes in addition the light setting and the view direction and can now from this appearance code predict for this particular pixel the color under this light condition and view direction. So how does this work? Let's look at some results. First, we performed a shadow analysis where we were changing the light location. On the right, you can see the ground truth. On the left, you can see the results produced by our approach. Note that this requires for every pixel to execute the rendering equation only a single time because we use a point light source. As you can see, the shadows are learned relatively accurately. with a few details uh, missing. We also performed a reflection analysis where we now change the viewpoint. In this case, we use a more complex environment map that's uh, looking like this here to illustrate how our results, um, how our method can produce viewpoint varying um, appearance based on this environment map. And of course, in this case, we need to execute the rendering operator or the surface light field. We need to query the surface light field multiple times during the execution of the rendering operator because we have not just a single point light source, but multiple. Here on the right, you can see how smooth the result looks like if we now apply this and rotate the object. This is basically just demonstrating how powerful the representation is and what it can actually learn. It's not conditioned on an image yet. And here's a different environment map where you can see clouds mirroring in the surface of the vehicle. The next experiment we did is uh, on single image appearance prediction, where now we condition additionally on a, uh, an input image using an imaging code or producing a latent code. So now we have a model that's trained such that it can take an additional RGB image and from that infer the surface light field. So here are some results. First, we look at some results with the ground truth geometry. You can see the input image on the left, the image to image translation results on the right. This is a pure 2D method. And this is what happens if you change the light location. And these are our results. And this is what happens if you change the light location. It also works with inferred geometry. Here on the left, we can see the input. On the right, the geometry inferred using an occupancy network and the surface light field that has been estimated for this input image. Note that only a single input image is given to the approach. And it also works with real input images. So this is the scene that we've seen in the beginning. And finally, we can also use our model as a generative model. In this case, we were using a variational autoencoder-like setting where we take the target image, encode it using an encoder, and then decode it again using our model. And then we can, of course, sample new um, appearances from our model. And here is some results for latent appearance space interpolation. So you can see the light location is fixed, but the appearance changes. So this is all fine, but as I already mentioned, uh, there is a problem. 
there's not enough data sets to train such models. They require huge amounts of training data, different viewpoints from objects where the objects have realistic material properties. So one project that I want to quickly present that we also conduct in our lab is to work going towards more realistic data sets. In this paper on joint estimation of pose geometry and spatially varying BRDF, we do a first step towards this setup. The goal is a data set of 3D indoor scenes that is captured with high accuracy from a handheld mobile sensor. For this, we built a custom sensor rig using a depth sensor similar to the Microsoft Kinect and active illumination plus an RGB camera for material estimation. Here you can see the light surrounds that can be turned on and off using an Arduino device. And then we take this handheld device and go around and scan objects and ultimately we like to scan entire rooms and buildings with that. We formulated an approach where both materials and geometry are estimated jointly. If we um, want to estimate accurate geometry, we require to know the appearance properties precisely. But vice versa, if we know, um, uh, if we want to estimate the appearance, we want to, we need to know the geometry precisely. That's why we f we try to formulate both tasks jointly, where we just provide a rough initialization for both and can come up with a precise inference result of all quantities. The contributions of this work that we also present at CVPR here is a joint formulation over pose, geometry, and spatially varying BRDF using a single objective function minimized using off-the-shelf gradient-based solvers, which is in contrast to prior work, which often uses an alternating optimization scheme of multiple different objective functions. We obtain a meaningful segmentation into different um, parts in terms of their material and accurate geometric details. Here we can see some results on the left for relighting and on the right for novel viewpoint estimation. We found that joint op optimization of geometry and material and pose helps to improve the results but this is only a first step. Object level reconstruction remains challenging, in particular with a limited number of observations. Note that we just have this mobile sensor that we move through the scene, which produces a much sparser light field compared to a, a gantry rig, for instance. So the goal is now to scale this to larger scenes and also to scenes where we have external illumination. Here, in this case, we're assuming that there is only the light source active and all other lights are turned off. Another uh, data set that I want to quickly present to you that we are working on at the moment is a, is a new version of the Kitty data set. A new version of the Kitty data set that has a 360 degree viewpoint and also semantic labels for all parts of it. It's actually a data set that we have been working on since 2016 already, but we uh, will be releasing that data set only this summer. Uh, due to various issues in in actually finalizing the data set. As you can imagine, the last 10% always take the majority of the time, so that's why it took us so long. The data set is composed of many different driving scenes. Um, here you can see the training scenes for this data set, and it has, as you can see, semantic information attached to each 3D point. It features, in addition to the front-facing stereo cameras from the Kitty data set, also 360-degree fisheye cameras and in addition to the Velodyne laser scanner, a SIG Pushbroom laser scanner and a GPS localization system. We have recorded about 73 kilometers of driving um, that yields four times 83,000 frames in total. All frames are accurately geolocalized, which allows for exploiting information such as OpenStreetMap, for instance. And we, we are um, labeled using accurate semantic labels they are consistent with cityscapes and we use 19 classes for the evaluation that we plan. Each instance is assigned with a consistent instance ID across all frames. So unlike other data sets where images are labeled individually, what we did here is we labeled images um, based on the 3D information. So here's an illustration of the sensors 
of the data set, you can see the left and the right forward facing camera and the fisheye cameras. And here you can see the um, 3D point clouds produced by the Velodyne laser scanner, the SIG laser scanner, and the stereo system. Here you can see a reconstruction of one particular scene. And on the right, you can see that we labeled not only the cars as we did in the Kitty data set, but we also labeled the road, the sidewalk, and the buildings and the vegetation using bounding boxes. Using an inference algorithm that does joint inference in 3D and 2D space, we then obtain labels, semantic labels, um, both for the point clouds as well as for each pixel in the image. And all instance labels are consistent across time. We hope that this data set will become valuable for research in various domains, including multimodal estimation, trajectory prediction, novel view synthesis, um, reconstruction, simulation, and more. With that, I want to thank you for your attention. I will also thank you, my sponsors, for supporting our research. And I want to point you to this website here, which is our blog, if you're interested in our research, to find out more. Thanks.